construction industry for 33 years. Um, licensed AME for 24 years, bit of a home builder. Uh, I've done presentations at the uh, AME Association seminars. I'm currently involved with the Maintenance and Airworthiness Working Group, which is a uh, combination of Transport Canada and industry panel, where we deal with exactly this, uh, trying to inform pilots who are wannabe aircraft owners or current aircraft owners who have lots of questions. Um, I'm currently the director of maintenance, or in Canada, we call ourselves a, a person responsible for maintenance with Diamond Aircraft in London. Uh, and I have experience with uh, mostly, I would say 99% in general aviation with uh, maintenance, overhauls, refurbishment, repair design, importing, exporting, painting structures, which is wood, metal, and uh, either fiber uh, reinforced plastics or graphite reinforced plastics. Um, and um, I was involved with uh, a company years ago where we became the first Transport Canada recognized composite training, uh, approved composite training facility in Canada. So quick rundown of me. Uh, if you've seen me at SOSA, I've probably been flying my little HP-18. And that's how you'll recognize me at, at SOSA. Um, quick show of hands, if you can go to your um, button. How many people are currently aircraft owners? All right, I see two. And how many of you want to become aircraft owners? And there's the numbers increasing. All right. Perfect. Okay. Um, I have about 90 slides to go through. I've asked uh, Sean to sort of help me keep an eye on the time. Um, we can go through. If you guys have questions, uh, raise your hand and um, either put it in the chat group and we can answer the question. Um, I think I have this fairly orchestrated so that in anticipation of what everybody's questions are going to be, um, near the end, I have a slide um, that will provide you with a complete list of all of the links that you could go back and do your own homework with uh, in order to retrieve more detailed inspections. And I don't know how to do this, Sean, but at the end, um, I'm happy to share the, uh, the presentation with, I don't know, with SOSA. I don't know whether we can put the presentation on the website for people to, to go back and review later um as a as a powerpoint uh rather than looking at the at the youtube so uh whatever works uh, i'm happy to help and answer questions either today or or if days weeks months go through go by uh, and you have more questions um by all means you can use me as a resource so anyway here we go um lots of people always ask me what is the responsibility of an aircraft owner and uh, hopefully I can answer a lot of your questions today. Some of the typical questions that I've heard people ask is what do I need to know as an owner? Where do I find that information? Who is responsible for what? What can happen to those that do not follow the regulations and the requirements? Then sometimes I get a comment that it's just a glider. Do all the same rules apply? Uh, what can I do on my own? And a Yorg asked me to tack it at the end. Um, I want to become an aircraft owner. How do I buy a glider? So I've got a few slides at the end um, that will tackle that subject. Canadian Aviation Regulations um, is the first stop to determining what you actually need from a legal perspective. Uh, a lot of paperwork to go through. Um, I'm not gonna touch on the financial issues with owning an airplane. That could be something that maybe somebody like your could go through uh, or Sean. Um, and we also have the burden, uh, when you own an airplane, obviously you have to manage that asset and you need to take care of your investment, ensure that the aircraft is well-maintained, stays cosmetically fit and thus maintains its value. Um, and along with that obviously is the aircraft maintenance, which is what we're sort of going to tackle here. Um, you need to maintain your airplanes and hopefully I can show you through this presentation, what you need to do uh, in order to do that. 
Uh, for those of you that aren't a COPA member, uh, COPA has a great website with a lot of information available. Uh, again, this link is copied at the end. Um, now you do have to be a member to access the information, but I, and I can't remember what the membership fees are, but they have an awful lot of guides and how to's and really have put some work together in presenting some of the same questions. And again, aircraft ownership, uh, in light of, of how the cars are written an airplane is an airplane and it doesn't matter whether it's a 747 or a 233, the majority of all of the rules still apply. So, um, the COPA's information obviously pertains to uh, single engine aircraft most of the time, but it doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of the rules are still applicable. For those of you that don't know, the Canadian aviation regulations are required to be followed by all individuals and entities within the aviation industry. This includes pilots, mechanics, and owner operators. The regulations are designed and implemented in such a way that there is sometimes room for interpretation and written with a legal tone. Um, I've heard some people draw conclude not draw a conclusion, draw similarities between uh, the regulations with regards to aircraft and tax laws. That sometimes it is open to interpretation, and there might be a little bit of a gray area. Um, but if you're not sure, seek out somebody that will help you. Uh, review and make it clear to you if you if you're not quite sure so this presentation is going to focus on the cars obviously that stands for canadian aviation regulations as they apply to the aircraft um, owner although some rules and regulations apply to all aircraft not just gliders so within the umbrella of the cars we need to consider the following. We have the Aeronautics Act, we have the regulations, we have the standards, and we have advisory material. The Aeronautics Act is why the regulations have been created. The proposed rule changes and successful pending rule changes, um, for those of you that don't know, they're public and they are issued via the Canada Gazette. And again, that's a link at the bottom. Um, and the Aeronautics Act. I'm not gonna go into too many details with regards to the act itself. Um, if you ever really wanna read it, uh, I've provided a link for it, uh, you can, uh, but it's a pretty boring read. So briefly, the Aeronautics Act is an act of parliament providing the basis for the regulations of the aeronautics. The act empowers the governor and council to make regulations to carry out the minister's mandate. The existing powers as set out in the Act provide for the making and repealing of regulations and the Act remains unchanged. Principles of the cars. Um, Transport Canada likes to review the cars and apply the fact that this is a risk-based approach to regulations. Um, the cars will change over years. Um, they aren't quick to change. Somewhere else in the presentation, I'll identify that sometimes the regulations take a while to uh, catch up with technology, for example. Um, the cars were rewritten a number of years ago in order to minimize the regulatory burden. Um, increasing the delegation of regulatory authorities. So there's a lot of, so obviously there are employees of Transport Canada and we have delegates. Uh, that don't work directly for Transport Canada, uh, but are delegated with certain um, uh, privileges and authorities uh, that, that allow them to work on behalf of Transport Canada. Well, the CARS by definition is the Canadian Aircraft Regulations. There are two parts to the regulations. The first part obviously is the regulation itself. Um, and they're obviously created out of the Aeronautics Act. The regulations identify to you as the owner or a uh, aircraft document holder, which includes those of us that are pilots. This is what has to happen. And the definitions within the cars are what is required to be followed. Uh, if you don't follow those, you're considered to be non-compliant and that could or would generate a violation. The standards, as we go through this, 
identifies the how we're going to comply with it. So there's two parts to the regu to to what most people in the industry refer to as the cars. One is the regulation, and the second part is the standard. Uh, it's easy. The regulation just says this is what you shall do, and the the standard says this is how you're going to do it. Um, there's all everything that's white here, by the way, uh, there they are screenshots of the actual um, uh, transport website. Um, so you'll I didn't have time to type all of this stuff out. Um, there is an error here. Don't tell Transport Canada that I'm pointing out that they have an error. They don't like that. Um, it says here that's divided into eight parts. Generally, each part corresponds to one of the broad areas of aviation within TCCA. The regulatory provisions of each part are grouped together. And then there are subparts and there's chapters and there's sections. Um, parts and divisions are cited using uppercase uh, while subparts are the lowercase. So I've tried not to get too technical with how I presented the, the, the actual numbering as I go through the cars as how how they pertain to aircraft ownership. Um, you can get all of this off the Transport Canada website. When we go through this, you'll find out that there is the numbering system. And for some of the sections, the numbering system is the same. So one of the chapters we'll deal with is aircraft uh, and equipment maintenance. The 600 series, so 605, for example, is the regulation and 625 is the standard. So section 605 will tell you what you have to do and section 625 will tell you how you're going to have to do that in order to comply with the regulation. So as I said before, this little cut from the TC website says there's eight parts. Clearly there's 10. Um, we're not going to go through all of these. A lot of these don't pertain to aircraft ownership. So we are going to deal with part one, uh, part two, part five, and part six. The other parts, if you ever want to go through, they deal more with uh, the piloting aspect of, of aviation versus the aircraft ownership and maintenance side of aviation. So, uh, some may argue, but I think that the easiest way for me to present all of this data is simply to go through the order of which the cars were presented, which is starting at section one, and we'll go through them sequentially. Uh, again, I hope that I've answered or anticipated answering some of your questions. So if you could wait a couple of slides before you ask a question, because I may already have anticipated it and it will come, uh, but there's a lot of sequence to this. So I'm gonna deal with part one, the uh, general provisions. Um, there's an awful lot of information in, in part one. Uh, a lot of it is basic, generic stuff. Um, again, I've pri provided a link. Uh, you guys can go back and, and open that and, and read it should you feel that you want to access more definitions um, within section one. So here's, a, a again, straight off the TC website. It shows you all of the subparts, chapters within section one of the aviation regulations. Um, I didn't get into advisory circulars, um, but they're there as well. It's a, it's a good website, um, lots of information for you. So as I found, as I went through, I, I was gonna include more definitions um, than what I found, but, um, or what I've presented, but there are an awful lot that I think you guys could, benefit from reading through just so you understand what Transport Canada's definition is for, for a lot of these these topics and, and, and words. Um, if you ever feel like you're tired and you can't sleep, just open up section one and start reading. I'm sure you'll fall asleep real quick. So Transport Canada determines an aeroplane, means a power driven, heavier than air aircraft. Um, aircraft flight manual, and airworthiness directive. An airworthiness directive means an instruction issued by the minister or by civil aviation authority responsible for an aeronautical product 
type design that mandates a maintenance or operation act to ensure that an aeronautical product conforms to its type design and is in a condition for safe operation. Airworthiness limitation means a limitation applicable to an aeronautical product in the form of a life limit or a maintenance task that is mandatory as a condition of the type certificate. Airworthy, in respect of an aeronautical product, means it is, a, is in a fit and safe state for flight and in conformity with its type design. Um, I snuck this one in here for appliance. That's a term that we use, obviously, in the industry. We don't typically refer to that in soaring, but we could because it means any instrument, mechanism, equipment, or apparatus or accessory that is used or intended to be used in operating or controlling an aircraft in flight installed in or attached to or intended to be installed in or attached to the aircraft and it is not part of the airframe engine or propeller of that aircraft so by definition you carry a pda into your cockpit you mount it to an arm it is considered an appliance owner why we're all here in respect of an aircraft means the person who has legal custody and control of the aircraft or system. Glider is a non-powered driven heavier than air aircraft that derives its lift in flight from aerodynamic reactions on surfaces that remain fixed during flight. Powered glider uh, means an air airplane that with engines inoperative has the flight characteristics of a glider. So if you ever want to go through the definitions, Transport Canada does not have a definition for a motor glider. Um, so this will apply to what we in soaring call self-launchers or sustainers. And again, I, I remind you that while we've come accustomed to this, uh, the technology has yet to catch up. And so the regulations don't cover um, very specifically, the differences between what we in the in soaring know as a difference between a self-launcher, a sustainer, and, and, a, and a regular normal glider. All right, so that was uh, the first part of part one. Now we're into division two, which is compliance. The owner or operator of an aircraft shall, on reasonable notice given by the minister, make the aircraft available for inspection in accordance with the notice. So essentially, if somebody as a representative of the minister asks you for information, you have to apply or comply. Um, so that includes the holder of an aviation document. You guys have pilot's licenses. That's considered an aviation document. You have an ownership or a C of A or a C of R for an aircraft in your name. That is an aviation document. Um, Obviously, like your car, you can't lend out your aviation document to a person. Um, that includes the documents with respect to the aircraft. Any questions on part one so far? Am I moving too fast or too slow? Everybody's asleep already. Perfect. All right, uh, so here's the first example where we have uh, part two of the cars. So these are the regulations. And anything with a two in the second digit is the standard. So we may have a regulation here that says that the aircraft identification and registration, um, this is the rule. And over here is how we're going to do that. So. Aircraft identification registration. Um, in the regulation, it says you cannot operate the aircraft unless it is unless its marks are visible and displayed. The, if you go to car two twenty two, it'll tell us how we have to comply with that. I'll get into a little bit more details. Now, I want you to keep in mind here. Um, 
Um, some of us are club members. If for some reason there's an error with regards to the interpretation of how a glider should have had its registration marks applied to the aircraft, if you're the one operating the airplane at the time that Transport Canada shows up at, at the club and you're the one that's landing the airplane or prepared to take off in the airplane when they come to do what they call a ramp check, your PIC, the regulation here says subject to subsection two, no person shall operate an aircraft unless its marks are visible and displayed. So it's not the gliding club that's going to get into trouble. It's the pilot. So we talk about the registration marks painted on the aircraft or be affixed to it by a means that provides a degree of permanence similar to that of paint. So they've left themselves a little bit open here, which is why we're allowed to use vinyl registration, external uh, grade uh, vinyl. It, it does have permanence similar to that of paint. Distinct and not obscured or confused by a similar letter that is not part of the marks. It must be Roman capital type without ornamentation. I've seen gliders where they have nice font. It's nice, pretty. It does not comply. Formed by solid lines that contrast in color with the background of the color of the aircraft. Now, this is where we get into a little bit of interpretation as to what you determine is contrasting in color. A light pale yellow over a white airplane is likely not contrasting enough. Black on white, obviously, is the best contrast. Um, so this is one part of the, of the regulation that um, may be an open to interpretation. So those people that I help with imports, they typically get dark gray, blue, red, uh, dun black, um, but I try not to mess around too much so there isn't room for somebody else to offer their opinion and determine that it's not in contrast and color. Here's an important one. Displayed so that there is a margin of not less than five centimeters, approximately two inches, between the edge of each letter of the part and each edge of the surface on which the part are displayed. So, while everybody tries to make their letters as small as possible, you can be in violation if you go the other way, if the letters are too big, which on a 747 is never going to happen, but on an ASW 27, where the tail boom gets really small, if your marks are too big and the C, if you have a bunch of C's and G's in your letter, in your registration, and they wrap around the top or the bottom, you cannot clearly identify what the letter is. You are now in violation of not being able to say that the registration marks are affixed in accordance with this regulation. So more regulations. These apply to all heavier than air aircraft other than a helicopter gyroplane. So we have to have it on each side of the fuselage um, <clears throat> or alternative structure in the area between the wing and the tail surface. In the case of a single vertical tail, you could have it on each side of the surface of the tail or um, on the outside of each vertical multi-tail if you happen to have two, which we don't have in gliders. So um, the display of marks on the bottom of the wings used to be mandatory. It is now optional. Provided the marks are displayed on the aircraft. Um, sorry, not provided. If you do put them on the wings, sorry, this is how you have to do it. Obviously, we're not going to, our wings are too long. We're not going to go from one tip to the other. We're going to put them on uh, one wing, and the letters have to be arranged with the tops facing the leading edge. And again, we have to be within five centimeters of the front edge and the trailing edge uh, in order to have the, the, the marks on the wing. So specifications for the letters in the marks displayed, all the letters must be of equal height, 
we're going to get into some real technical stuff here. I'm not going to go through this, but it there is a lot of math that goes into this. We're talking about the heights of the letters, the widths of the letters, um, the thickness of the letters. Right down to certain requirements where it's different for letter I, M, W. Um, unless there's a reason to and somebody wants to pop up their hand, uh, I wasn't going to go through all of these in details. Uh, you can go to the cards if you're interested and, and do the math. Um, if you ever want to have vinyl letters cut for your airplane, I would go to the regulations, print this out, and provide that to your um, artist that's going to make the cut file for your letters so that they are so that the letters are in compliance with these requirements. If you're going through me, I already have a, a provider that has this programmed in. And I just keep monitoring the cars to make sure that nothing has changed. And so I just give him the letters that I need. Um, and I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> Marks is played at an angle. So we can we can put them on a, on a slope if you want. But there's rules for that. So Marks displayed on either side of the surfaces. So when not displayed under the wing. So we're not putting them under the wing anymore. You need to make them as big as possible, up to 12 inches, if the structure of your aircraft permits it. If the structure of your aircraft doesn't permit it, then in the case of a glider, you can go three inches or the structural dimensions of the aircraft, whichever is bigger. And remember, we have to provide a margin of five centimeters or two inches, and we're talking about perpendicular measurements of the tail boom uh, from when you're looking at, at the tail boom from the side. So you can't use a, a ruler and measure from the top of the letter around the tail boom to the center line of the fuselage. You're looking at this from the side, perpendicular, uh, two inches. So it's it means that there's quite a, quite a big gap between the center line of the fuselage and the top of your letter. <clears throat> Any questions on uh, part one or two at this point? All right. So now we're going to get into the airworthiness. This section does not follow the rule where number two as a second digit identifies the standard with a, a direct reference to the regulation. But if anybody's been in aviation long enough, there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts, and um, some generalities, but it's not always the same. So we have the regulatory stuff. Again, most chapters have a, um, most chapters have um an interpretation section, the big ones do. Uh, those are always good for, for reading in case there's definitions that you're not familiar with. We're not going to touch on all of these, obviously. Um, we only have a couple of hours. Um, I'm showing you this simply because, again, we go back to the fact that the regulations are based on the Aeronautics Act. And so there's a lot of legal stuff that goes into this. So when a section or subpart of a is changed they are going to identify it within the regulations that it has been repealed these are dates um well it's initially it's a date but then it's, it's a number um but they show that um so that you you there's no if any if any numbers out of sequence they leave it in there to show that there is no error there's nothing missing These are just some more. So we're gonna deal mostly with um, 501, I've got a thing going on, 507, 521 with regards to uh, SDRs and 42.6, which is their readiness directives. <clears throat> Uh, 
and I'm going to keep repeating this because it's a, it's a thing that I need everybody to understand that there's a difference between the regulation and the standards. Um, so, for example, airworthiness part five, subpart 71 deals with the aircraft maintenance requirements, which is the regulation. And then we go to standard 571, which is titled as maintenance. So very similar numbers, different formatting. One is the regulation, one is the standard. So we'll deal with 501 and 522 as well. Sorry, just for interest sake. And 571, I believe. I think I snuck in at 507 as well. <clears throat> 571, aircraft maintenance requirements. This subpart applies with the exception of remotely piloted aircraft systems that include remote yada, yada, yada. Uh, in respect of the maintenance and elementary work performed on. All Canadian aircraft. Again, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a 233 or a 747. Um, and parts intended for installation on those same aircraft. Okay. Maintenance and elementary performance work rules, 57102. A person who performs maintenance or elementary work on an aeronautical product shall use the most recent tools, methods, techniques, practices, parts, materials, tools, equipment, and test apparatus that are. And we go through a whole bunch of stuff. Specified for the aeronautical product. Equivalent to those specified by the manufacturer of that aeronautical product in the most recent maintenance manual or instructions for continued airworthiness. In accordance with recognized industry practices. Okay. A person who performs the maintenance or elementary work pursuant to subsection one shall ensure that any measuring device or test equipment used meets the specifications of the manufacturer of that piece of equipment and is calibrated if required. This obviously doesn't apply if you were operating an aircraft under a special certificate of airworthiness, such as owner maintenance or amateur built, but I'm not sure that anybody here would want to use a torque wrench if they haven't proven that it's calibrated. That's the kind of stuff they're talking about. Recording of elementary maintenance, sorry, recording of maintenance and elementary work. A person who performs maintenance or elementary work on an aeronautical product shall ensure that the details required by standard 571, so you can see here that we're still dealing with the regulation, that the maintenance is entered into the technical record for the aeronautical product in respect of the task performed. So we talk about this a lot in our aviation industry. The logbooks, the technical records, the logbooks for the airplane, you only record that which you did. You don't identify the stuff that you didn't do. Um, so if you change the tire, you identify that you changed the tire. So uh, what this means in plain English is that any maintenance action must be recorded in the aircraft technical records and the difference between a maintenance action with respect to elementary work and any other work not described is that the other work needs to have a maintenance release. So back to the statement where it says a person who performs maintenance or elementary work, we're saying here that whatever you do to an airplane, regardless of whether you're the owner or the AME, uh, you need to record that work into the technical records. We're going to get into some details about the difference between a, a logbook entry for an AME and a logbook entry under the requirements of elementary work uh, a little bit further on in the presentation. So a maintenance release. No person shall, sh shall shine the... No person shall sign a maintenance release required pursuant to Section 605.85. We'll get into Section 605 as well. Or, or permit anyone whom the person supervises to sign a maintenance release unless the standards of airworthiness applicable to the maintenance performed and stated in 571 have been complied with and the maintenance release meets the applicable requirements specified in 571.10. So... The described maintenance has been performed in accordance with the applicable airworthiness requirements. That is the maintenance. That's what we're talking about as a maintenance release. That is the statement that an AME needs to make when they're putting an entry into a logbook with regards to work that he performed or she. 
No maintenance release is required in respect of any task designated as elementary work. Um, I'm gonna go through the list of elementary work for you as well. In the case of a glider or a balloon or an unpressurized small aircraft that is powered by a piston engine and not operated pursuant to car four or seven, could be the pilot. Uh, in the case of an aircraft operated under, we don't need to do that one. In the case of an aircraft, we don't need to do that one. Where a person signs a maintenance re release in respect of maintenance performed on an aircraft, the satisfactory completion of which cannot be verified by inspection or testing of the aircraft on the ground, the maintenance release shall be made conditional on the satisfactory completion of a test flight carried out pursuant to CAR 605. I'm not getting into conditional releases too much. That's more of a, an AME thing. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. Five oh one. Requirement to report. So this is we're talking about the a, annual airworthiness information report, which for the last couple of years wasn't required, and they've now re-implemented it. So those aircraft owners that that went last year without doing it. This year, you now have to report for two years, and I believe it's due by the end of March. So if you haven't uh, done it yet, you're going to have to soon. <clears throat> flight authority. Uh, flight authority and noise certificate uh, are in the same subpart. All this basically says is that you have to have a permit issued by Transport Canada that allows you to fly the airplane. It is typical in our sailplane industry that it is considered a certificate of airworthiness. Rarely do we get flight permits for ferry flights or whatnot because our airplanes come apart, they go in trailers and there's no need for ferry flight permits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we'll get into it a little bit when we talk about buying an airplane, but the order of operations is you obtain a certificate of registration, then they will issue a C of A. You have to have both. There, neither of them expire, but there are things that you have to do to ensure that they remain in force. Any questions on this? All right. Um, as I already stated, the most common in, in our soaring world is a certificate of airworthiness or short form C of A. And it's a standard C of A. Um, rarely have, have we issued flight permits. Um, if you have a home built, uh, you would get a special certificate of airworthiness dash amateur build. It's still considered a C of A. Um, again, they don't expire, but your aircraft is not airworthy until it has had an annual inspection and that validates your certificate of airworthiness. Just because you have a CFA doesn't mean you can fly, but you have to have an annual to ensure that your CFA remains in force. Uh, you also have to comply with your air, airworthiness directives. Uh, we don't deal with this a whole lot in our gliding community, uh, but I wanted to make you aware. Um, an SDR is considered, it's called a service difficulty report. They're not mandatory for non-approved maintenance organizations. So there's a different requirement for maintenance organizations by which you have to submit them. But as a glider owner, uh, with no operating certificate, et cetera, et cetera. There is no mandate for you to comply with uh, sending in SDRs, but anybody can do so. So if you have found a problem with your airplane, you and your AME can decide whether your AME sends it in or you send it in. Um, but if you ever see something wrong that you think Transport Canada should be aware of in order to improve aviation safety, that is the means by which you would contact Transport Canada and file an SDR. Uh, you can go to the WSDRS system. Uh, you can do it electronically. You can download the form from their website, the 240038 form. 
and hand bomb it and mail it in or scan it and, and email it. <clears throat> 522, uh, I'm just putting this in here as, a, as, as an interest uh, for those of you that are wondering. Um, 522 is the requirements that a glider would have to meet in order to receive a type certificate. Um, the requirements for gliders between US, Canada, EASA, Australia, New Zealand, um, they're not any different. In fact, uh, JAR 22 in Europe is the same as CAR 522 or Everything's Manual Chapter 522 in Canada. So I just did a quick highlight here. If you ever want to go into that and see what it is that requires them to comply what they, what Transport Canada requires you to comply with in order to be an aircraft manufacturer or type certificate holder and apply for a type certificate to be approved within Canada. This is what they go through. All right, um, I put this in here because airworthiness directives. Um, the airworthiness, the, the minister is required to issue a readiness directive as a, a way to ensure aviation safety when there's a, an unsafe condition. The airworthiness directive shall obviously identify the unsafe condition, the affected aeronautical products, which could be by a year of manufacture, could be based on an aircraft serial number range, it could simply say all, uh, it would have to specify what your corrective action is and uh, the schedule by which you would have to do it and what the effective date of that AD is. The onus of ensuring that the airworthiness directive for a specific aircraft is complied with lies with the owner of the airplane or aircraft or glider. So, in the case of SOSA or any other club, somebody has to be responsible for ensuring that the ADs are identified to an AME to become complied with. If you're a private owner, you need to ensure that your ADs are identified and you have to make the request to an AD to an AME to perform the work as identified within that airworthiness directive. Um, I think I touch on it a little bit later, but in Canada, we have the we have the requirement of complying with all Transport Canada released airworthiness directives on a Canadian registered aircraft, but we are also required to comply with any AD that has been released by the country of origin. So 90 something percent of our sailplanes are all built in Europe. So any EASA AD that is released is likely to also have a corresponding Transport Canada AD, but not necessarily. So you are required to also ensure that you comply with countries of, uh, of origin ADs. All right, any question on part five? I know I kind of blew through all of that. So Eddie, I've got a question. Um, yeah. you, you say these airworthiness information reports, we have to submit by the end of March? I believe it is, yes. Okay, I can't, I just couldn't find anywhere. The only thing I have is an email saying you've got to do it. It didn't say anything about a date. So I was going to actually ask that question. So, um, okay. That, I, that I think it's, I thought it was the end of March. I actually haven't done mine yet either. It, because... It's March 30th. Okay. Which I think or something like that. Yeah. Which is like next week. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't done it. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, Go do it. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> And then secondly, um, is there a place where we would have a record of all the ADs that have ever been issued on an aircraft? 
Yes. Stand by. I'll show you guys. This is a good question, Sean, because there's probably some owners here that don't know how to do this. Um, let me just take this away for a second. <clears throat> All right. Didn't work. The Transport Canada website typically goes down on the weekends. Um, but if you go to if you go to the CAWIS site uh, and there's a link, I think, at the end, um, you there is a way for you to type in your aircraft registration. Okay. And it will spit out all of the ADs that are that Transport Canada has determined is applicable to that model. They don't do the homework to determine whether it's applicable to your specific serial number. So if you happen to have a Arcus M and you and there might be ADs applicable to the propeller, the engine, and the airframe. Um, those will all be listed. Then you have to specifically go into each AD, find out what. I wonder if I could pull that up. Let me just let me just try. So, so, Ed, this only yeah. works if you have the aircraft registration. If you don't, then if you're trying to buy something, um, how do you find that the, this out? Oh, so on the I'm just I was just I'm, bothers me that they um, they don't. I didn't plan on it to not be available today. There is a way to go in there where if you don't know the registration, you can go by maker model. And because it's a public website, so say you're say you're interested in buying an LS8. And you happen to know the registration of Sean's LS8. You can punch his registration in and it'll 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 come up. It's it's there's nothing in there that is private. If you follow me. So you can go by you can go by manufacturer. You can then go do a drop down by, um, um, by model. So you you could find all of the ADs applicable to an LS8 if that's what you're looking to buy. Okay, thanks. If you follow me, I'm sorry that I can't demonstrate it. the The website for the TC for the ADs typically goes down on Saturdays or Sundays, and I didn't account for it, and I should have done a screenshot. And it didn't, it didn't, uh, sorry, gentlemen, I didn't uh, plan on that. No worries. Where was I? Eddie, I did manage to get in this, Tom. Oh, did you? Yeah. So did I. Yeah, well, I don't know why I can't. Oh, okay. Here we go. Now I'm in. So if we want to do, what's your registration? Sorry, not AD number. Registration mark. What's your registration? Golf Romo Kielowski. Oh, he's. I'm just picking on Sean. Okay. So we punched in his aircraft registration. We know now that it's an LS8. And it, here is the history of all of the ADs listed against that airplane. So typically what I then do is I go into 
I do a cut and paste. I export this to, to Excel. I create a list and then I identify whether it's complied with or not complied with. And I sign it off and I put it in the customer's uh, logbook. So if we wanted to see something uh, specific, uh, okay, there's this one. This one's generic. It goes against all gliders that happen to have L'Hotelier fittings. So you click on it and there's the PDF. It tells you what you have to do, when you have to do it. Um, and so it is the owner's responsibility to identify that this AD is due to your AME. The AME would then sign off that he did it in accordance with this data. Any questions on the search? So if we wanted to go back here and you didn't know the registration, you could go here, you could go to, and we get the same list. Thank you, very helpful. Um, and if you know specifically what you're looking for, I mean, there's, it's obviously, it's a, it's a search function. Um, so you can be as broad or as specific as you need to be. Any other questions on the AD? Where were we? We did ADs, okay. Now we're gonna get into general operating and flight rules as it pertains to um, part six. So again, we have the regulatory requirements and we have the standard. So I'm going to focus here on 605 and 625. Then I snuck one thing in on, on, on part six. <clears throat> so some key highlights here. No one person, shall, sorry, no person shall operate an aircraft in flight unless a flight authority is in effect. So obviously if you don't have a C of A, don't fly the airplane. The aircraft isn't operated with the conditions set out in the flight authority. So if you have a permit, there may be limitations. <clears throat> Availability of the aircraft flight manual. No person shall conduct a takeoff in an aircraft for which an aircraft flight manual is required by the applicable standards of airworthiness, unless the aircraft flight manual or if an aircraft operating manual has been established under the operating manual is available to the flight crew members at their duty stations. How many people have actually flown with their air with the AFM in their airplane? I bet you nobody does. Note, it is required for you to have it on board. And if you get ramped, um, or somebody asks you to provide it, you're supposed to have it on board the airplane. Um, placards and markings take uh, a considerable amount of, of, of space within the Canadian Aviation Regulations. So here's another reference. And no person shall conduct a takeoff in an aircraft in respect of which markings or placards are required by the applicable standards of airworthiness unless the park markings or placards are affixed to the aircraft or attached to a component of the aircraft in accordance with those standards. So... <clears throat> um, the AFM, for example, section two of your flight manuals will determine what are uh, placards that the manufacturer has determined must be on the airplane. The regulations are telling you that you have to follow the compliant, fall, follow the, the, the requirements of your aircraft flight manual. So if your flight manual lists placards that should be on the airplane, they need to be on the airplane. Otherwise, your aircraft is not considered airworthy. Um, they don't necessarily have to be verbatim, 
they need to meet the intent. So um, the things that get um, Transport Canada, AMEs, etc., is anything that, especially placards, which could affect the flight safety of an airplane. So missing the placards on the inside wall of your of your cockpit that states the uh, CG limitations, states um, airspeed limitations, especially if there's air, airspeed limitations uh, that change with altitude. Uh, those are placards that really, they need to be there and there's, an, there's, a, there's a reason why they need to be there. It, uh, it, it's, it's there to provide a level of safety. <clears throat> So we get here to aircraft standards and serviceability. I want to make note of this comment for people. No person shall conduct a takeoff in an aircraft or permit another person to conduct a takeoff in an aircraft in their custody and control unless the aircraft equipment required by these regulations meets the standards and is in a serviceable condition. So, um, any questions on that? Again, we're talking about regulations here. Are uh, digital copies satisfactory? A digital, we are we are in that age um, that you likely would have a winning argument. Thanks. Especially in a sail plane where we have. Um, Ergonomical ergonomic restrictions. Where are you going to put this manual? There's no sense in having it behind the behind your headrest where you can't reach it. Um, but I would say yes. If you had a digital copy, you would probably be safe. Thank you. Um, one thing I didn't put in here, which I should have, thanks for that question, Tom, that just reminded me. Most aircraft manuals is where you have your weight and balance report. You're supposed to have your weight and balance report on board the airplane. All right. So we're talking about uh, equipment and aircraft requirements. You need to have an altimeter and airspeed compass. You need to have a radio if you plan on being in class C or D airspace or any MF or other controlled area. If you don't plan on flying in any of these areas, then you don't need a radio. But if you plan on being in there, you have to have a radio. Now, we can we could spend a lot of time on this too, but if you have a radio, you also need to have a station license. And if you have a radio, you better have a radio license that allows you to operate the radio. So that's the regulation. This is what Transport Canada says you shall have. Just like every other legal um, aspect, that's not quite 100% true. So we also have what the aircraft manufacturer via their type certificate has also said. So I'll pick on, what did I pick on here? This is the D2. So this is the Discus 2 type certificate number G-113, we're at issue three, okay? So on top of the minimum requirements we just found in the cars, also in the type certificate data sheet, it says that you shall have a weak link for towing. Well, we all have weak links. We call them shorties, and now they're part of our tow ropes. But it's very specific at what yield strength that that weak link is supposed to be at. There's also a section in the TCDS that says required equipment. And again, this has been defined as what's required per the manufacturer. You shall have your flight manual. We already talked about that. You shall have an airspeed indicator. Well, that agrees with Transport Canada. You shall have an altimeter in feet. Compass. Four piece safety harness, an outside air temperature indicator, 
and a parachute. Now, these are specific to the D2. We could go through a bunch of different examples, but this is specific as to what's on the type certificate data sheet for the Discus 2B. The parachute, I can tell you if you go through CAR 522 or JAR, 5, JAR 22, um, and then to be honest, some gliders call it a 10 centimeter, but um, the D2 says eight, because that's what was in the airplane when they tested it for crash worthiness. The outside air temperature is there as a requirement because this specific aircraft has water ballast. And again, we go into placards and it says all placards listed in the LBA approved flight manual. They don't tell you which placards specifically. They just say, we're going to maintain the manual. You keep the placards in accordance with the manual and you make sure those placards are on or in the airplane. Any questions? So what this means here is, for example, because it says a four-piece safety harness, it's also implied that that four-piece safety harness, for example, is operational and operating correctly. You can't arbitrarily decide, well, it's just a quick flight. I just need my lap belt. I don't need my shoulder harness. No. Nope. If it's not operational as a four-piece harness, then you're not airworthy. You can't fly. All right. <clears throat> I don't know how I don't know how how specific uh, Transport Canada would feel because the regulation only says that you have to have an altimeter, and this Transport Canada approved type certificate says it shall be in feet. Not sure how sticky they would get if you had an altimeter that happened to be in meters. All right. I get a lot of questions on transponders. So transponder is not a minimum piece of equipment for a glider. But if you have one, you have to make sure it is tested in accordance with the regulations, which means you have to have it tested every two years, calibrated, by somebody who has the equipment to sign off that it's appropriately functioning. Okay. A <clears throat> uh, quick show of hands if people want me to spend a little bit more time on transponders. I can go through this, but... Uh... Okay. So, um, because we're a glider, we don't have to have one because it says here, no person shall operate an aircraft other than a balloon or glider in transponder airspace. Okay. There are requirements. Again, you can, you can have a transponder and you can have it removed. Um, that doesn't mean that you have to, can, have to ground the airplane if you had a transponder installed and then you take it out. but you have to have a transponder if you want to go into transponder airspace. Okay, so again, it depends on your transponder, whether it's a, um, a mode A, mode C, or mode S. Most transponders coming out these days are automatically mode S. Most transponders are going to be uh, ADSB compliant. Uh, I would ignore the rule. I would ignore the conversation going on between Nav Canada and Transport Canada at this point, because right now they're talking about uh, transponders that require diversity. Um, that conversation is going to carry on for a while. And even if they do make it applicable to aircraft, sorry, airplanes, um, as of January 1st, 2025, I believe is the current discussion point, um, where, um, they're going to do the same thing as what they did in, 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 um, in the States 10 years ago. Um, I'm not sure that all these conversations are going to actually um, end up with a ruling where transponders with diversity only will be approved for installation uh, for Cana aircraft, Canadian aircraft operating in Canadian airspace um, as of January 1st, 2025. So um, <clears throat> gliders will still likely be exempt, but if you're going to fly your glider into a transponder required airspace, then you obviously you have to have a transponder. Now, 
that being said, I also have heard stories where air traffic control does not have to allow you into their zone, even if you have a transponder. So just because you have a transponder doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the cooperation of air, tra air traffic control to enter that area. So um, again, now we're getting into flight rules uh, and, and away from the air, aircraft and um, maintenance, uh, maintenance rules. Um, was there a specific question that you had, uh, Dan, or, or did I answer it? No, I didn't have a specific question. It was just a bunch of stuff there that you are on the in, in the white square that I thought you best covered. Okay. Um, hello, I, I put a few questions in the chat there a few minutes ago. I oh, wonder sorry. if you could answer those. Let me just see if I can. I got to hide this bar or something because I'm not seeing the chats. Um. Oh, here. Okay. So question about uh, owner maintenance. The answer to your, so the question is, uh, suppose a Canadian glider in the owner maintenance category is flown in American airspace. Is the in Canadian insurance valid? The short question, the short answer to that is no. Because if you have an, uh, a sailplane that is in the owner maintenance category, you are not allowed to fly your airplane in American airspace. Period. End of story. No permit allowed. Nothing. The U.S. has said if your airplane is Canadian registered and is owner maintained, you are not allowed to fly it in, in U.S. airspace. Period. Okay. Good. So, to... I'm not the insurance guy, but I can tell you that the insurance company would say, did you follow the regulations? And if the answer number one is no, then they'll void your insurance. Right. Okay. When a glider is sold in Canada, how long does the previous owner see if R remained valid? I would say that there is no validity because if I'm a, if I'm a buyer and you're a seller, I'm going to hand you a check and you're going to hand me the interim registration, which means that it's now my glider. And as the, as the buyer, I have seven days to report that I bought this airplane. Okay. So, uh, the C of R immediately based on that paper copy of the interim registration immediately becomes the, um, the um, under the rule that we just read half an hour ago or an hour ago, where I am now the owner of the airplane because I have care and control and custody. Okay. So it, the, the onus is now on the buyer within seven business days has to notify Transport Canada with a change of address and ownership on a sale plan. Okay. So once I do that ownership, once I do that within seven days, how long does it take for Transport Canada to send me a proper C of A and C of R? Uh, well, there is no change in the C of A. All right, C of R only, right, C of R. It will take Transport Canada as long as it takes Transport Canada. But I can continue flying under that. Interim. Yes, as long as you have then... If it ever goes really long, just make sure you have proof that you sent it in. Okay. Well, that, that was if you send it in, they'll send you a temporary certificate, normally for three months. Yes. I so, see. and and then um, yeah, if you don't get your proper one, then uh, you have to bug them. But normally, I mean, I got mine in three months. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, so there were a couple of repeat questions there. So I think, did I have I got everybody's questions answered so far? Oh, sorry. Um, can you fly in class C in a glider provided you have a radio and are clear by? 
Yeah, we're getting into some flight ops stuff, which I'm not the specialist on. Um, if you are in Class C and you have a radio and you are well, cleared by ATC, um, then yeah, I think you're good to go. They may not allow you in if it's a trans if, if you're required. So for London, for example, if you talk to them and said you were going to skirt the uh, the the north edge as you transition from, I don't know, Lucan through to Stratford, um, they might say okay, but they probably wouldn't let you come in in order to enter the circuit. Um, <clears throat> all right have i got everybody's questions up to date so far um i had one more uh okay. suppose i'd like to buy a glider from the states but the owner has a an experimental certificate rather than standard okay How can you save that question for the end sure yeah perfect okay um where were we? All right. So uh, we talked about transponders. Now we're into ELTs. Again, um, as far as gliders go, we're not required to have an ELT. Um, but if you have ELTs, then you need to make sure that they're properly maintained. And so the, the ELT, like the airplane, needs to be inspected every 12 months. Um, but that doesn't mean that the 12 months has to concur with your annual inspection. It just means, because they don't have to happen at the same time. They typically do, but they don't have to. Um, your AME can inspect the ELT every other year. And then every 24 months, it has to go to an approved avionics facility because it's considered specialized maintenance. They have to open it up. They have to do an inspection for corrosion, uh, which is on the circuit board, a bench test, and inspect the batteries, again, mostly for corrosion. And then um, the, there's a life limit on the batteries. Typically, it's five years, and, and you're supposed to keep record of that component requirement within your technical records of when that five-year life is done. Um, and then at that five-year life, you need to send the battery, the ELT away to have the batteries replaced, and then you can put the airplane, you can put the ELT back in your airplane. Uh, any questions on ELTs? Okay. Uh, quick ELT requirement table straight out of the cars. Um, an aircraft may be operated without an ELT on board if the aircraft is a glider. Okay, so I kind of broke that uh, secret to you with the previous slide already. Um, if you have an ELT and you have a record of it being installed in the airplane, there are ways you can fly without the ELT being installed. And obviously, since we're a glider, you don't have to have it anyway. But if you have the ELT installed and you took it out, um, then you have to make a recording that you took the ELT out, okay? For those of you that have ELTs, please keep in mind it is the owner's responsibility of the ELT and of that aircraft that you have registered the ELT with the Canadian Beacon Registry. Nobody can do that for you. That can only be done by the owner. And you have to have your ELT properly programmed. So don't buy an ELT from somewhere in the States. Assume that it's just an, a nice ELT and not have it reprogrammed. Your Amy will have, will identify that to you. But even if you buy an ELT online, it's used. Um, you need to get it reprogrammed with your registration. Okay. And then register that ELT with the Canadian Beacon Registry. Any questions on ELTs? Okay. 
Just want to do a time check with you, Eddie. What time is it? 20 after 5? Quarter after 5? Yeah. Okay, I'll speed things up here. Uh, ELTs again. Okay. ELT activation. Maintenance requirements. Okay. No person shall conduct a takeoff or permit a takeoff to be conducted in an aircraft that is in the legal custody and control of that person other than an aircraft operated under blah, 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 blah. Um, is maintained in accordance with any, any airworthiness limitation applicable to the aircraft type design, meets the requirements of any airworthiness directive issued under section 521 and 521.427. And except as provided in subsection two meets the requirements of any notices that are equivalent to an airworthiness directives that are issued by the competent authority of a foreign state of approval or an aeronautical product in which respect no type certificate has been issued yet the component of competent authority for the foreign state of that manufactured product. A lot of legal terms. The owner or the person who is carrying control of the airplane needs to make sure it's being maintained in accordance with everything. End of story end of statement done period or you don't fly the airplane you're not allowed to let somebody else use the airplane either okay if there's ever a conflict for everything is directives um that can be a pain in the ass uh we just had that um, we, there was an AD issued where the FAA issued an AD that, um, they didn't capture the latest revision of a mandatory service bulletin as issued by the manufacturer. And so the AD was asking the owner operators to ensure that the MSB was being complied with at the wrong revision. This may sound like it's um, who cares, um, but from a compliance requirement, there was a change between Rev 1 of the mandatory service bulletin from the manufacturer and Rev 2. And the AD said you could only apply with Rev 1. It didn't say Rev 1 or higher. It was clearly a typo. But in order for everybody, while the FAA digested all of that, we had to apply for an alternate means of compliance that would allow us to do the work in accordance with Rev 2 of the service bulletin, even though the AD takes precedence and it only referred to Rev 1. So it does happen. Um, but remember, your requirement as an owner ends at hey mr ame i have this ad can you please look after this for me your ame will have hopefully experience with doing the work and will go through the legal jargon and ensure that everything as a requirement of the that ad is met and if there's any issues concerns we'll deal with that and identify that back to you uh, should there be an issue Maintenance, release, and elementary work. All right. So we talked about elementary work. Um, everything that's listed, and I'll show the list in a little bit here. Everything that's listed as elementary work are items that aircraft owners can accomplish without the direct supervision or a maintenance release by an AME. Uh, I showed you the example of what a maintenance release statement looks like. That's the statement that the AME will make in your logbook. You know, that I've done the work in accordance with the applicable standards of airworthiness. On that list, for example, is removing the wings off of a sailplane. If they were designed to be removed uh, by the owner. So you can do that. But you have to record every time you remove your wings and put them back on again. Just doesn't require an AME license, but you still have to record in the logbook that you took your wings off, you put them back on again the next day. A maintenance schedule. Subject to subsection three, 
here. So no person shall conduct a takeoff in an aircraft or permit a takeoff to be conducted in an aircraft that is in the person's legal custody and control unless the aircraft is maintained in accordance with the maintenance schedule. So as aircraft owners, you guys have to decide what your air aircraft maintenance schedule is going to be. You can decide at the time that an airplane receives its certificate prior to receiving a certificate of airworthiness, you have to declare how you're going to maintain the airplane. Are you going to maintain it in accordance with the aircraft manufacturer's recommendations, or are you going to maintain the airplane in accordance with subpart six, um, part five, well, that's part four, part seven, sorry. Um, the aircraft owner can decide whether to do it in accordance with the aircraft manufacturer's recommendations or in accordance with 625 Appendix B and C of the Canadian Aviation Regulations. Once you've determined that, you can't break that schedule unless you redefine what the new schedule is going to be. There are ways of getting other maintenance schedules approved, but we're talking about uh, flight operators, flight schools who want to do things a little bit different than either Transport Canada or the aircraft manufacturer uh, want to do. For example, um, the aircraft manufacturer or the engine manufacturer says you you shall change the uh, the oil every 50 hours. Well, if you have an operating certificate and you say, well, I fly 10 hours a day, I'm not bringing my airplane in every five days for an oil change. I want to do it once a week or 75 hours. So you have to put together a plan. You can get it approved by the minister and then you can do it in accordance with your plan, which is 75 hours as opposed to 50 hours. Um, but the onus is then on the person who's applying to make sure that you demonstrate that there is no uh, effect on aviation safety. Okay, if you're going other than somebody else's recommendations. Inspection after an abnormal occurrence. So an abnormal occurrence is uh, subject to some interpretation. There is an appendix in the, I didn't copy it, but appendix G tells you what to look for. All it tells you is an abnormal occurrence. What's an abnormal occurrence in, in gliding? Well, maybe landing in a cornfield as an off-field landing could be subjective and, and, and determine that it's an abnormal occurrence. Uh, landing on a 4,000 foot sod field, probably not. So there is some, like I said, there is room for some interpretation there. But you as the aircraft owner, operator, have to decide whether it's defined as an, uh, as, as an abnormal occurrence and then respond accordingly. You would be required then to take the airplane to somebody who could do this uh, if it requires disassembly. Otherwise, the pilot in command can, can look at Appendix G and C. <clears throat> um, as an AME, then I would be complying with Appendix G and making a logbook entry. All right, technical records. Um, I think I got to speed up a little bit here, but uh, technical records for gliders. If you don't have an engine or a propeller, you can have all of your technical records in one book called the Journey Log. If you have an engine, if you are a self launch or a sustainer and you have an engine, and a propeller, you need separate books for each component. Okay, within those records, you need to um, prove that you've done the maintenance on all of the components if they are not what we call in phase with the airframe. So an ELT, a transponder, uh, they need to be calibrated every 24 months. Um, and a compass needs to be done every 12 months, but that doesn't mean it has to happen at the same time as your annual inspection. So if your annual inspection uh, gets done every June, but you have your transponder done in January, that's okay. As long as you're within the time limit of that component by the, when the annual is done and or when you're flying, you're in compliance. Um, every person who makes a technical record, an entry into a technical record, is ob it's obvious. It has to be legible. It has to be permanent. Um, 
for those people that use um, stickers for logbook entries, uh, it's standard practice now um, because, you know, I'm not a great hand writer. Uh, so I like to type my stuff out. If I peel and stick it, uh, because I'm peeling and sticking, um, I can't redo that logbook entry and put another copy of that logbook entry if I make an error on top of the logbook entry that I put in there. I have to stroke it out and put in a complete new page. If, if, if you make an error, there are sections within the regulations that tell you how to deal with errors. So the peel and stick logbook entry would, would fall under the, the guide that as if you've made a typo in hand, handwriting your logbook entry. So if you make a typo in, in your hand bombing a logbook entry, you stroke out that word, you don't obliterate the word, you can't use whiteout, you can't put a black Sharpie marker over top of it, you just a single stroke, you carry on and you identify it. So if there's been an entry made on a, on a peel and stick <clears throat> where it's sufficient enough to replace the entire logbook entry, you have to replace the entire logbook entry and stroke out the entire logbook entry so you can still see it. <clears throat> Journey log. So this is very applicable to just gliders. Uh, typically, everything that goes in the journey log is a copy of what goes in all the other logbooks. But in the case of a glider, assuming we have no engine or prop, all your entries are going to be in the same journey log. Um, other than a club ship, uh, it's doubtful that a glider will go through its glider and owner uh, will go through an entire journey log in a period that they own the airplane. I wouldn't worry about it. Journey logs aren't that expensive. So even if you get to the second or third journey log, who cares? You're required to carry it on board. Except if you plan on returning back to your airport of departure, then you can leave it in your car. However, uh, I didn't put this in the screen. Most people keep their insurance, their C of A, their C of R, uh, their weight and balance, a lot of that stuff's in the back of the journey log. So you may not be required to have the journey log on board, but you are still required to have a copy of your weight and balance. You're still required to have a copy of your C of R. You're still required to have a copy of your C of A. Sorry, not copy. You're supposed to have the C of A and the C of R. Uh, the nice thing about the C of R's now is it used to be, they used to be issued by um, Transport Canada and mailed to you. Now they send you a PDF. So if you have a PDF file, of your C of R and you lose it, you can just go back home and reprint it. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, they don't have to be visible uh, from the cock from the cockpit. So they you can have a little compartment where you keep this stuff. Um, doesn't have to be beside you. <clears throat> uh, we've talked about this uh, technical records other than the journey log. Um, Engine log, prop log. Um, if you have specific components, you need a component logbook. Um, but basically, anything and everything that you want to identify uh, should be kept as technical record. Okay, so copies of your Form Ones, copies of certificates of compliance, uh, depending on where you bought the part. Uh, if you if you've installed it in your airplane, you better keep the traceability of of where it came from. Um, keep all of your records, keep them neat, concise, in order, because when you sell the airplane, it is a requirement that you have to transfer all of the technical records to the new owner. It's your obligation as the seller to provide all of that information to the buyer. Now, as the buyer, you just need to know enough that you need to ask. I want all of the records and they have to have all of, they have to provide you with all of the records that they have for that aircraft. They can't withhold anything. Uh, we did one, we had one question about liability insurance. So I just wanted to point this out. This is in the miscellaneous section. 
uh, of the cars uh, that says that you have to have insurance. Unless you find a reason under Section 7 that you don't have to have one or don't have to have insurance. Anyway, just thought I'd put that in there. Now we get into the standard. So I'm not going to, obviously there's an awful lot. We don't need to talk about cockpit voice recorders or flight data recorders or anything like that. So we're just going to go through a few things here. Unserviceable equipment. Eddie, there's yep. a question from Dan. Sorry, I don't have my, I have to go to my, okay. The question on um, certificates for like instruments. Yep. So um, what certificate is it I need to keep that I got with my instrument, if I bought a new instrument? Uh, you should have been given a, what they call a form one. That seems to be that, uh, okay. I think I know what you mean, yeah. Okay. So yeah. In, if, in, if, a, if, a, if a component has a, uh, has a TSO, you're likely gonna be able to get a, um, a form one. If okay. you bought the part from an EASA or Canadian country, it'll be called a form one. If you bought the component from the US, it'll be an 8130 three it's basically the same thing it's like it, it, right um if it's a commercially viable product um that has been stated by the aircraft manufacturer that is suitable for use on your aircraft you might get what they call a certificate of conformance or a certificate of compliance but it's not the same as a form one okay thanks um, this does include, sometimes it does include, so for example, in our Diamond aircraft, there is a there is a Form 1 for me to download when I upload the new software into the G1000, because it, it can affect, basically you can think of it this way, if there's any way it can affect aviation safety, that somebody might at some point ask you to prove how and where and who you got that from before you put it in the airplane. So while FLARM isn't mandatory, if you have it in the airplane, you better treat it as if it is a certified piece of equipment. Um, I know now we're getting a discount on FLARM. So if you aren't keeping up with your FLARM firmware, um, I don't know whether they void out your complete insurance, but they might not give you your... $25 discount or a $50 discount or whatever it is they give you these days. Anyway, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, if it's a piece of equipment on your airplane, you better make sure that all the equipment's working properly. That's basically the sense the, 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 the gliders don't have a minimum equipment list um, other than what we showed you before, right? So if you have an altimeter that isn't working, you technically, you shouldn't take off with it. Um, some aircraft do have a minimum equipment list that is, you know, an absolute minimum. So if, if you <coughs> have an MMEL, um, master minimum equipment list, it might say, okay, you, you have to have two altimeters on board. Therefore, if one goes unserviceable, you are not going to be AOG. You're not going to, you're not going to be restrict yourself from not flying. Okay. All right. Maintenance in general, uh, details regarding the approval maintenance schedule. So we talked about this, uh, before the aircraft owner has to decide what maintenance schedule they want to follow, uh, you have to make sure that you're following the airworthiness limitations of anything that's on or in your airplane. Uh, so if you have a life limited part, like a transponder needs to be checked every two years, an inspection task. So if you're, if you fly a, um, Sorry, Sean, I'm going to pick on you because I just remembered off the top of my head. If you fly an LS product and there's a 3,000 hour inspection required, you have to have the 3,000 hour inspection done. Um, Schroth seat belts are 12 years. Godringer seat belts are 12 years. 
Again, doesn't have to coincide with your annual inspection, just has to be done every 12 years. Make a logbook entry, copy of the certificate in your logbook that, that so-and-so rewebbed your belt, and there's a copy of the Form 1 stating the work order number that they did it to in case anybody wants to audit them. Um, you have to keep all of that stuff. We talked about uh, airworthiness directives and SDRs. <clears throat> um, we talked about the type design, state of responsibility. Um, has to be a Canadian AD and or an EASA AD. Uh, maintenance release and elementary work. I think we've touched on this a little bit. So as, a, as, a, as an AME, I'm required to make a statement in your logbook every time I work on your airplane. If you are working to the elementary work list from CAR 625 Appendix A, you too have to make an entry. You just don't need me to make a maintenance release. Again, this is a common phrase that we find in the cars. Uh, no person shall conduct a takeoff or permit another person to conduct a takeoff. Um, it is the owner's responsibility to advise any person operating his or her aircraft of the, any maintenance that the aircraft might require pursuant to the regulations. Okay. So don't let your friends, don't you fly your airplane or let your other, or let your friends fly airplanes if you know that there's something due on your airplane. Um, okay. Annual inspections. I quite often get asked, can I do the annual? And then I have to ask the question, to what standard am I doing the annual? Am I doing it to the aircraft manufacturer's checklist? Am I doing it in accordance with CAR 625 part one or part two and or part two and or appendix B and or appendix C of the cars? Okay. It is up to the owner to tell the AME to which inspection you want them done. Common question is, when is my annual due? It says there on the last day of the 12th month following the preceding inspection. So if your inspection was done on June 1st of 2023, your annual inspection requirement is not due until June 30, how many days in June? 31st of June. There's 30 days in June. All right. June 30th. But what's how's, How do you do that with your knuckles? Anyway. Um, so any day prior to the end of the month that you had your annual signed off on, you have until the last day of the same month, 12 months from now, if that makes any sense. So... If you had your annual signed off on the first, <clears throat> you could almost get the equivalent of 13 months of flying done before you actually need your annual signed off again. So that's an easy way if, if your annual happens to be at a bad time of year, um, you can start to push your annual towards the direction that you want if you, if you want your annual to, um, to be at a different time and you don't want to pay to have an annual done twice within the same 12 month period in order to put it at a different date. Anyway, questions on this. Does your annual have to be done within that 12, 13 month period? What if you miss a month? Then you can't fly, but it doesn't mean anything. No, no. I mean, it doesn't matter if you can't fly, but you know, will it, Nope. There's no penalty for not. There having is no it. penalty. That's why I said before your A, your C of A, and your C of R will never expire. But it's stated in there that the airplane must be airworthy in order for you to fly. In order to verify the airplane is airworthy, it needs to have an annual inspection. So, say you park your airplane in the trailer and it takes you 18 months. You have a problem. You're sick. You're whatever. You you don't fly for 18 months. You can't fly. There's there's nothing wrong with your paperwork. You have your annual inspection on the 18th month. You fly the next day. There's there's nothing. You do have to state though, and we could go back and look. There are some there are some requirements within the annual airworthiness information report that if you're idle, and I can't remember for what the period is, 
if you're idle for more than five years, I think you have to report that your airplane has been idle because they might question if you keep reporting zero flight hours uh, for, for your consecutive, um, they might they might consider your airplane decommissioned. But I can't remember what those flight times are or what the calendar requirement is. Uh, this was just for your for your reference. Okay. Elementary work. This is a big question I get a lot of times. What can I do on my own airplane? Um, so look at the statement here. The following list is exhaustive. Okay. So it means if the task is not listed in the next screen, then it is not considered elementary work. And if it is not considered elementary work, then it has to be done by an AME. Or at least it has to be released by an AME. I, as an AME, I have to provide enough supervision relevant to the work performed in order for me to be able to sign off a task. Uh, I support owners in wanting to participate in their aircraft maintenance. That's how I do my annuals. I have them help me. I have to be satisfied that the task was carried out uh, in order for me to release it. Um, but the stuff that's on the next list here, here we go. This stuff you can do, you have to record that you did it and you don't need to have an AME check the work. So we'll find some stuff that might be relevant here. Removal and replacement of tires, wheels, landing skids or skid shoes, not requiring separation of hydraulic lines on small privately operated aircraft. So if you can take your wheel assembly out and change the tire without disconnecting the brake line, then you can do that without having to have an AME sign it off. Um, Removal and replacement of glider wings and tail surfaces that are designed for quick assembly. So obviously a lot of the gliders we fly are all are exclusively designed to be taken apart and put in a trailer. But again, we go back to the requirement that you have to make a logbook entry. So by rights, every time you assemble and disassemble your airplane, you should be putting a logbook entry saying, wings removed, wings installed. Um, and it just needs to be clear and concise. I use rigged and derigged. And so, I put in rigged, and if there's a series of dates where I can clearly show that the airplane was, you know, and I draw an arrow with my signature, um, I put it together on the 1st of August, I took it apart on the 5th of August, therefore I must have tied the airplane down in between. I don't have to make a statement every day. <clears throat> um, so you can... You can take out your seat belts. And put them back in. Uh, avionics that are not racked or otherwise designed for rapid move or removal and replacement. Um, but you have to make an entry. Uh, your batteries, you have to make an entry. Removal and replacement of uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, um, repetitive visual inspections or operational checks. So there are a number of um, airworthiness ADs. Um, there's a couple um, out there where they ask for certain inspections to be carried out prior to flight. If that's a requirement of the AD, then you as the owner can make that make that um, make that logbook entry. All right. Um, so again, it talks about if there's tools that you need to use, 
in order to do the work that you just carried out, you have to follow the same requirements for your tools as the AME. Again, the only difference is you don't have to have an AME inspect for the tasks that were listed in these lists. Um, okay, I think I've hammered that out a little bit. So, summary to date, uh, up until now, the aircraft owner is responsible for determining the requirements of the aircraft maintenance, the schedule, and scope. The aircraft is responsible for assuring the airworthiness directives are complied with, country of registration, and country of design, and or manufacturer as may be applicable. Uh, we talk about TCA, so Transport Canada will duplicate the, the, the ADs as issued by EASA, but sometimes there's an overlap by a couple of days, which may, may affect aircraft safety or not. As the AME, they're required to comply with the approval or acceptable data to ensure the scope of work meets the standards. So you as owners tell the AME what you want done. The AME has other rules and regulations that he has to comply with, but basically you're gonna tell him that you want the annual done. He's gonna follow it and inspect and make sure that the hardware is not corroded, the bolts meet the requirements and all that stuff that they learn. And then he says that he did it in accordance with the applicable standards, but you're the one that has to tell him what you, what you want done as the owner. All right, here's your list of links. Uh, if you guys want to screenshot that, that's fine. Um, I can somehow maybe talk to Sean about getting this uploaded um, to the social website or wherever we want to put it. There's a number of links that I've used. Any questions about this? Because the next three or four slides, I'm just going to talk about aircraft purchases. Uh, I have a suggestion. Can, Ed, can you just uh, copy the links from here and just paste them on a chat? That will be really quick. I can try to do that, yes. Oops. Actually, you can put the whole presentation in the chat at the end, Ed, if you wanted to, and people could just download the whole PowerPoint deck if you wanted to do that. I could try to do that. I'm That's quite simple. Kind of guy. If you look at the chat, there's just going to be a little icon that looks like a folded over page there. It just says file. Click on that, and you can upload the whole presentation. In the chat? Yeah, right at the bottom. You'll see a little pencil, a little smiley face guy, and then right next to it says file. Oh, file. Yep. Yeah. If you click on that, just put the select the file you want, hit enter, and the whole file's in the chat. People can download it at that point. Okay, I'll do it at the I'll see if I can do that then. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Any questions right now? I it's, it's been a lot of information. Okay. I'm gonna try and summarize uh aircraft purchasing. So a lot of regulations that we can now refer back to when we're talking about buying an airplane. My, when I get a phone call that says, hey, I'm interested in buying a glider, what should I do? My first reaction is always find one local or find one that's in Canada and buy it. If you don't have to import one from somewhere else, don't. However, uh, you might not find the glider that you want. You might want a new one. You might want one from the States, you want wherever it comes from, whatever. Um, things that you need to consider. Previous repair history. Um, both the documented and the undocumented repairs are going to be points of concern. Obviously, the documented ones are the ones we're going to find in the paperwork. The undocumented ones are the ones that can become problematic. And may only be determined upon a pre-buy inspection or at the time of doing the first Canadian annual inspection in order to get the C of A issue. Um, I've had that happen. I've had an airplane where we were doing the inspection for C of A and we were able to determine that the resin used during a repair it was considered a major repair, was not the resin approved by the manufacturer. That brought the, the whole project to a halt. And the cost, so not a complete end of story for that project, 
other than the fact that the repair could have been redone, <clears throat> but the cost of redoing the repair with the appropriate materials would have outweighed the value of the airplane. So, uh, can it happen? I don't want to share all the horror stories uh, because they're not frequent, but there are things that can happen going through the import procedure. So if you have the opportunity to buy a local airplane that you know is well-maintained, it's already got a Canadian registration, it's already here. Um, we talked about the interim CFR. You could literally write the guy a check and be flying before the ink is dry. Um, that's always your easiest option. Now, I didn't put on this list um, what happens if your airplane that you want to buy from the U.S. is experimental. So in the case of repairs, Transport Canada, nor the FAA actually, repairs and modifications are in the same subgroup within the rules and regulations. So regardless of whether it's been repaired or modified, um, if it can be determined, because at some point the airplane would have had a um, statement of conformity at the factory to comply with something. It's very rare that the aircraft are actually different between being shipped to Canada, being shipped to the U.S., being shipped to Australia. There may be operational restrictions that are different between different countries. Like, for example, they allow cloud flying in England, but they don't allow cloud flying in Canada. So if the airplane came from England and you're going to bring it into Canada, we would have to remove the equipment that allows you to cloud fly. Um, because it's not allowed in Canada. But that doesn't mean that the wings are any different or the fuselage is any different. If a statement of conformity can be made at some point, and there are different ways of doing it, in Canada, they allow us to import an airplane with or without a certificate, with, with or without an export certificate of airworthiness from the country of, of sale. Um, it's easier if you get the person in this, if it's coming from the States specifically, you have them have them pay their local inspector to, to do a, uh, to issue an export certificate of airworthiness. You at least know then that the airplane currently meets a type certificate as issued by the FAA. Now, in some cases, there is no certificate of airworthiness issued by the FAA. In which case, don't worry about it. As long as you've had somebody inspect the airplane and prove that it will meet the Canadian type certificate requirements prior to having the certificate of airworthiness issued. Now, we have gone through this before. So if, if an aircraft left the factory in Germany, for example, before winglets were invented, and it now has winglets, if those winglets are an approved factory mod and done in accordance with done and installed in accordance with the regulations then it could be eligible for a certificate of airworthiness in canada if somebody just in their backyard decides that they're going to add winglets to this airplane because it's experimental in the u.s that would prohibit that aircraft from becoming eligible for an export for eligible for a c of a in canada except if you remove the wingtips and put it back to the original configuration, that just becomes a function of money. It doesn't mean that it's technically impossible. Um, so I've got a number of people that I've, I've dealt with in the past. I, I went quickly to a checklist that I've used to um, talk to those people and let them I know the rough order of, of, of procedures that has to happen when you buy an airplane. Um, before the airplane is, before you can get a C of R, there is a document called the MSI 26. It's available online through the Transport Canada website. You can take a look at it. It's 39 pages long because, again, it's applicable to every aircraft. So it's the same document that I have to use if I'm importing uh, a big twin engine airplane or whether I'm doing a glider. It's the same 39 pages I got to fill in. Um, the first 13 pages are considered the section eligible for import, and it has to be signed by a member of Transport Canada or a delegate that says that, yes, 
the airplane is eligible to be imported. So that means that there is a Canadian type certificate issued against that airplane. It doesn't mean that it can be imported. It means that it is eligible to be imported. Make sure, if in doubt, that you have your eligibility for import figured out before you make an offer to buy the airplane. Now, just because there's a Canadian type certificate doesn't necessarily mean that's, that that airplane conforms to this type certificate. So that's where it gets tricky. How far away is the airplane? Who are you going to have verify that the airplane meets the requirements? Um, this is where it gets into some territory that you need to likely get an AME involved with and, and potentially spend some money. Um, Recent example, uh, friends of mine looking at an airplane, they were looking at an airplane in the States. Uh, the owner had referenced a local ANPIA. Um, and I called that person in and I said, hey, so-and-so, hey, how are you doing? Fine, great. I see you just listed a discus. Yeah, you don't want that one. That one will have a pain in the, it'll be a pain to get put into, into Canada because it had so, had so many repairs done on it over the years. He knew right off the bat that it wasn't necessarily unsafe to fly. He just knew that the repair documentation and the procedures that they used to repair the airplane weren't, weren't in accordance with the Canadian rules and regulations, and therefore it was going to become a flower pot. So use your AMEs of reference if you can. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through this entire process here, but um, it's up on the screen and it's there. Um, The C of R comes after your eligibility for import. Once you have a C of R, then you can apply for a C of A. Um, sounds simple, um, but it can be it, it can be a little bit tedious and um, confusing, maybe to people that haven't gone through this before. I've probably in combination of import or export. I've probably imported or exported, I don't want to exaggerate too much, somewhere between 100 150 airplanes. So it's, uh, it's not news to me, but I'm happy to work everybody through it. Uh, I have a checklist. I have this available in Word. I email that to people who are thinking about it. And that's the end of my presentation. Who's got questions? Well, then I must have done a good job because I see no questions. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask one question. How does it right. work? How does it work with uh, split ownership? Um, I mean, there's a lot of references in the documentation to owner. Um, how does yes. Transport Canada do they care, or is it? Uh, yes, they do. There is actually, if you go to Car. Uh, Oh, now you're going to test me. There is, um, there is, there is, I think you can list up to four, four names on a registry, but only one person has one, but one of those, one of those people has to be determined to be the primary contact for Transport Canada for them to be able to notify you when ADs are issued. Thank you. Um, but there is a way to do it. <clears throat> Terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, Ed, I have a question as well. So I'm I'm in the market to buy a glider. I'm a relatively new pilot, been flying for four years. And I'm told that bringing in a glider from the States, sometimes getting a trailer across is more of a pain in the ass than getting a glider across at the border. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing I don't work for the Department of Transportation which is different than, than Transport Canada. Um, there are lots of ins and outs, and this is being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, but do you have any experience with regards to the, the importation of that the trailer? This video is being recorded. You can call <laughs> me later. Fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm from... No, uh, there, I, 
there are there are ways and to be honest uh there's lots of people uh that have gone through this um and it's um there 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 are some simple solutions okay so i know like i fly out of the, the gatineau gliding club and i know the uh rideau valley soaring bought an ls4 a few years back and they literally had to leave the trailer at the border for a few weeks or months they basically drove back down put the trailer the glider in the one of their trailers brought it across the border and then dealt with the paperwork for the trailer to bring it back sometime later. So, uh, yeah. And my dad and I had that too. We, we ended up having to leave the trailer in the compound and had to take a hotel on the Canadian side then drive back to the other side. Like, yeah, it, yeah. it can prove to be a little bit of a. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, and I see there's another question on costs and I'm curious about that as well. Like as an AME, um, if, let's say I hire you and I say, look, I'm bringing in a glider from New York state or whatever. Right. Yeah. What's the cost of like, what kind of cost would an owner be expected to incur? Is it. So I, I don't know how I'm not going to speak for everybody else. I'll just speak about what my rates are. Um, I charge a thousand dollars flat rate um, to do the equivalent of all of the paperwork and the annual inspection that has to, has to be done at the same time. Mm -hmm depending on the area that you get it in. So I have an MDM that I deal with here, minister's delegate for maintenance. Um, uh, he charges, I think it's 725 bucks to issue the C of A. Um, right. So you're talking, there's, there's $1,700 and change there. Now, if it's an older airplane and the airplane hasn't had an actual weight and balance in, in over five years and I have to reweigh the airplane, then I'll charge you things back like I have to rent the weigh scales to do it. If there's an AD that we find that we have to order parts and there's extra labor. So all of that would be over and above. Yeah. OK, good. Thanks very much. So the, the general figure that I advise people based on what I've had people go through is anywhere between two and four thousand dollars is what you could expect to spend. Perfect. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you for taking the time to uh, present this. Much appreciated. No, you're quite welcome. Yeah, so great. I am going to try. Let's see. I'm going to shut this down. Now. Just hit that file button, find your file, and hit enter. Um, yeah, I want to remember where I saved it. Too. <laughs> Where did I save it? Oh, there it is. Okay. So I'm going to go here. And I'm going to go to No. Where we see my secrets. Well, you got a pretty clear desktop. That's my second screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> But on the on the previous screen, it said uh, PowerPoint. So not only we see yeah, there it is, but this is yeah, but see, yeah. I keep opening it. I don't want. I just I just want to find it. Right, right click over it, and it might take you to the to where it is. Yeah, right click on where instead of clicking on it. There it is. Okay, so now I click on that. And I hit 
send. Okay. It's only 539 megabytes. So it should okay, be Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll come back tomorrow. There, it's got a little green checkbox. So it must be listed open there to the chat. So you guys should, we should be able to keep this then open then until everybody grabs that and saves it on there. I'm not seeing it in the chat. I don't know if anybody else is. Oh, I'm not seeing it either. You have to be careful, Ed. When you send it in the chat, it says two. You may have sent it to somebody specifically, right? Oh. Be sure it's sent to meeting room group chat or meeting group chat. Uh, it looks like I it looks like I sent it to Roy. Yeah, that <laughs> might be the problem. So so just do this again. So send it to meeting group chat, and then. Oh, I don't. I don't. Oh, meeting group chat. Send. If you pick that, you'll be all set. I gotta go through all this again. Yeah. This is why I have an IT department. There That's we go. Because I can't it. do it. Got it. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you very much. If you, uh, I'll take this then, Ed, and also upload it to our Hangar Talks website if I can. You're okay with that? Yeah, I'm okay with that. There's nothing proprietary in there. Great. Thank you very much, Ed. This was great. Yeah, thank uh, you. Um, I didn't put my personal information there, but we have. Um, I'll. I. You can type that in the chat too, if you want. Um, if anybody has questions, they can. There's my email. There's my personal email. Thanks again for doing this, Ed. It was really quite helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Sorry, we went a few minutes over time. You're pretty much on time. Hopefully we didn't force Jorg to fall asleep at the wheel. <laughs> Ed, can you give me a call either later today or tomorrow where we can discuss the status of the annual on EZ? Yeah. And also, I I'd probably need to make arrangements with your dad to get it out of his place. Well, let me finish. Let me finish the annual first. Well, any chance it'll be done by the 30th? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm hoping to have, I got a bunch of annuals that I have to try to get done before April 5th. Okay. Because I leave on the 6th and then I'm not back until the 15th. So I get that people might want to have their airplanes before then. So. Um, well, and I, I guess we have to get it out of your dad's place too, right? By the end of the month, so or soon after. Yeah, yeah. But it the weather is the weather in such a way that if if I need to help my dad get uh, get the trailer out, we can have him lined up outside so that nobody has to worry about when they're picking him up. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks uh, again for this, Ed. That's great. No worries. All right. Uh, and then, um, Sean, just because you're also a member of SOSA, if if SOSA members want this presentation done sometime in the clubhouse, I, I'm happy to do it again. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Well, uh, we'll kind of take a poll, maybe kind of later in the summer when people have been flying again. We'll uh, see if you're around and you can do it then. Yep. Over a barbecue. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Uh, Ed, just so you know, we had uh, we topped that at about forty-one people online. So. Oh. Okay. Okay, Perfect. everybody. All right, everybody. Happy flying. Thank you.